Hi, you guys. I hope you're having a good day today. Um, we are at our very last final chapter of Tuesdays with Maury, so we'll get to that. But first, I wanted to show you a website that I've come across and a poem that is on that website. So let's go over to it. So this website is called um, gratefulness.org. And I really encourage you to check it out because it has all these great kind of topics and they're specifically addressing um, being grateful and, and finding gratitude even in this stressful time. So um, you might want to look at it. And this is just um, just one of the pages on this whole website about gratitude. But they have a lot of nice articles here about living gratefully in the time of coronavirus and then... Um, how to be grateful in a crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So it might be something you want to look more at. However, the poem I want to look at today is this one right here, The Patience of Ordinary Things by Pat Schneider. So let's go over to that. So I'll just read it. The Patience of Ordinary Things. It is a kind of love, is it not? How the cup holds the tea. How the chair stands sturdy and four square. How the floor receives the bottoms of shoes or toes. How soles of feet know where they're supposed to be. I've been thinking about the patience of ordinary things. How clothes wait respectfully in closets and soap dries quietly in the dish and towels drink the wet from the skin of the back and the lovely repetition of stairs and what is more generous than a window that's a really beautiful poem about ordinary things and now that we're all kind of surrounded by ordinary things all the time um, it's nice to kind of think about them in this light how we rely on just our everyday things like chairs and shoes and how they always um, do what we need them to do. And it is an amazing thing. So you can take a look at this again on um, the website gratefulness.org if you want. But in the meantime, I hope you find some way to be grateful today in your life and in, in your day. Um, and in the meantime, we will go over to Tuesdays with Maury. So we left off yesterday at the end of the book. So we finished the original version of the book yesterday. Um, and then I was saying that there are these extra chapters that had been added on for the 20th anniversary edition. So that's what we're going to read today. And this extra part starts off with um, a poem by Thomas Hardy. The To Be Forgotten is the title of the poem. I heard a small sad sound and stood a while among the tombs around. Wherefore, old friends, said I, are you distressed now screened from life's unrest? Oh, not at being here, but that our future second death is near when with the living memory of us numbs and blank oblivion comes. So let me just get, go through this poem a little bit because it's a little, it might be difficult to unpack if you're seeing it for the first time. So um, the poet is standing in a cemetery and hears a small sad sound and asks um, kind of the souls in the cemetery, wherefore old friends are you distressed? So he's kind of saying, why are you sad now that you have passed on from the difficulty of life? That's what this line means, now screened from life's unrest. And then in the second stanza, the souls kind of respond and they say, oh, not at being here. So they're saying like, oh, we're not upset because we've passed. They say, but that our future second death is near when with the living memory of us numbs and blank oblivion comes. So they're saying um, we're not sad at having passed, but we're sad at a second death, which is when you become forgotten. 
So this next part is just called an afterword for the 20th anniversary edition. So again, this was just an, an essay or maybe a chapter that um, album the author added on after the book had been published and out for 20 years. So authors do this because you have an interesting kind of hindsight of, you know, you can look back to when you read the book and maybe also talk about the impact the book has made in those years um, between the publication and your, your afterward. I did go to Maury's grave. In fact, I've gone many times. At first, it was to keep my promise. Later, to keep my connection. Sometimes people wear out on visiting the dead. But I had already lost touch with my old professor once while he was here. I would not do the same after he was gone. My most recent visit was just a week before typing these words, which are to be published on the 20th anniversary of this book. It was early fall, a time of returning students and hooded jackets and colorful leaves growing brilliant as they die. Many of those leaves blanketed the wet grass of Newton Cemetery as I walked the familiar route to the small slab that bears his name. As I kneeled down, I noticed the dates on his marker, and I shivered. I was now closer to Maury's age during our Tuesdays than I was to mine. Hi, coach, I began, my voice as always self-conscious during these conversations. How's it going up there? Looking back on the pages of this book, I see I shortened the full account of the particular talk when Maury asked me to visit his grave. When he first brought it up, I told him I'd plan on coming anyhow. He gave a knowing grin. Not the way some people come, he croaked. Don't leave your car running, get out, put down flowers, get back in. Come when you have some time. Bring a blanket. A blanket? Some sandwiches. Sandwiches? And talk to me about life, about your problems. You can tell me who's in the World Series. I laughed and teased him. Who lays a blanket in the middle of a cemetery, eats a sandwich, and talks to the air? They'll arrest me, I joked. But as I grow older, I think I know why he said that and why it was so important to ensure my attendance the way a good teacher does. Deep inside, it was not dying that truly rattled Maury. It was being forgotten. To that end, it turns out he needn't have worried. My old professor is better known after his passing than he was when he was with us. Since the publication of this small book in 1997, which was only written to help Maury pay his medical bills, grade schools, high schools, and colleges around the world have come to use it in their curriculums, something that would have pleased Maury immensely. A TV movie and a frequently produced theatrical play keep his wisdom alive on stage and screen. But Maury, I believe, would have most wanted to remain vibrant in the hearts and minds of his family and friends. And two decades after his ashes were lowered into the ground, he surely does. But will we? The Thomas Hardy poem that precedes this afterword is a haunting story about a man who hears voices beneath tombs, voices bemoaning a second death, when memories of the buried soul fade and oblivion awaits. It's something I think about a lot. I remember in writing my book, Have a Little Faith, Rabbi Albert Lewis pondering how long he would be recalled. It seemed a needless concern. He had so many admirers in the community. But he gently pressed me to consider. His children, he said, certainly would remember him, his grandchildren as well, but their children, perhaps through pictures, and their children's children, 
Well, ask yourself, can you even spell your great-great-grandparents' names? The truth is, short of making some kind of history, few of us can hope to be remembered in any meaningful way beyond two or three generations. How then can we hope to live on? How can death end a life but not a relationship, as my old professor often quoted? How is Maury, not rich, not famous, not a household name while he was alive, managing to do it? I think I know the answer. Sometimes on Tuesdays, other people would visit my old professor, and they certainly did on days I was not scheduled. Over time, I noticed a pattern. Many who came determined to raise Maury's spirits, spent an hour in his office, and exited in tears. But they were not crying about Maury's sad fate. They were crying about their job, their divorce, their issues. I went in trying to cheer him up, they'd say, but pretty soon he was asking me about my problems and I was telling him and he was asking more and I was really telling him and then I started crying. I went in to comfort him, but I ended up being comforted by him. Finally, one Tuesday, I confronted Maury. I don't understand, I said. If ever anyone had finally earned the right to say, let's not talk about your problems, let's talk about my problems, it would be you. You're sick. It's a really tough disease. Why don't you just accept their sympathy? Maury raised an eyebrow. Mitch, why would I take like that? Taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. It is a profound sentence and so true because the opposite we know is false. Taking never makes you feel alive. It may be the basis of marketing, commercialism, Madison Avenue, but we know what Maury said about not buying the culture. Taking a new car, a new suit, a new flat screen TV, none of it will make you feel alive. It's a temporary thrill, gone quickly when the new smell or the warranty wears off. Maury understood this. It's why many of his possessions could be described as older model. He was invested in something else, giving himself away. At some point, During his dying, it became his immortality. Giving is living. And that, I can say, 20 years after its publication, is the biggest message of this book, a question I am often asked by readers. Sure, the other loving thoughts and aphorisms are essential to Maury's teachings. And at any given moment in life, you might find them coming to mind and shedding light. I know I do. But giving is living is more than something Maury said. It was his philosophy, his raison d'etre, maybe even his secret. At least it was a secret from me until the time when his lessons finally took hold like dye that slowly permeates the fabric. After his death, as a result of his urging, I got more involved in my community, in charity, working with the poor or underprivileged. Eventually, this brought me to Haiti, operating an orphanage, visiting it every month. And that brought me, almost exactly 20 years from my first Tuesday with Maury, to a little girl who, at age five, suddenly developed a cancerous brain tumor. And once more, someone I cared about and visited regularly had been given a death sentence. Only this time, I was the old one, she was the young one, and there was no one else to step in. And so I brought her to America to live with us. It was the beginning, in Maury's finest tradition, of something I never suspected, 
my becoming a teacher. Suddenly, the lessons he'd imparted on our Tuesdays together needed repeating not just to my inner soul, but to another human being, a small and precious child. Janine and I were determined to give her as rich a life as time and medicine would allow and teach her all that truly matters. In the year and a half that she has been with us, sleeping on a small mattress at the foot of our bed, giving to her has become my obsession, the largest consumption of my time. And I have never felt so alive. This is what I spoke to Maury about during my most recent visit to his grave. All I am learning, giving is living. Coach, you were so right. I think about him saying, I'm going to be the healthiest old man you ever saw. I used to say that too, but now I know you cannot bank on such things. Your blood, genetics, DNA, and future accidents are all beyond the reach of your declarations at age five or age 78. What is within reach is what Maury said all along. One day, one glance at the bird on your shoulder, one question, is today the day I die? And one good response on the day the bird says, Yes, this is the response that you spent your days giving of your time, of your heart, of yourself. That's how you live on for a day or through others' generations. Maury Schwartz never read a word of Tuesdays with Maury, yet he still reaches so many people. Why? because he took time in his dying days to give to a wayward student. And I wanted to give something back and wrote this book. And someone gave it to someone who gave it to someone. And now look how large his classroom has grown for a man who is no longer here to teach it. I visit his grave. You, upon reading these pages, visit his home. And we are connected not as waves, but as part of the ocean, through a short, silver-haired man who, in touching us, lives on. I can think of no better legacy for my old professor. I hope, wherever he is dancing now, it makes him smile. Mitch Album. So that is the final, final end of our book, including the afterward 20 years later. So I hope that's given you a lot to think about and I really encourage you to reread this book on your own or you can listen to it again but there's so much there and even in listening to it or reading it aloud to you all these years after I had first written it at first read it it really makes me um, appreciate the wisdom that it holds and um, just the generosity of spirit that's in it. And so I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that you joined me for the journey. We'll have to think of what book we want to read next. But until then, take care and be well and be grateful and always read poems and books. We always have that no matter what. Have a great day, you guys. I'll see you soon.